Good morning. My name is Becca Meckler, and I'm excited to read Psalm 115 with you today. So if you'll join me. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to have to move this mic stand because if, if this is your first Sunday, you may not know it. But if you've been here before, I do a lot of like gymnastics and lateral movements in between here. It's very nerve-wracking if you watch online. It like comes with like a warning before, like motion sickness guaranteed pretty much. That was funnier than that response, Scott, okay? Like, if you came and you're in a bad mood, it was like an announcement, you're like, where am I? I get it, just shake it off, right? Shake it off. Welcome. My name's John, as I shared. I really am grateful to be with you. Today, we are concluding our series, our summer series, through the Psalms. We are going to look at Psalm 115. Psalm 115 is a beautiful hymn, but it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It's written by an anonymous writer. We don't know exactly who. And it is written at a time in the history of Israel when we don't know when. Now, scholars have speculation on was it this time or was it this time? Here's the reason why. At the core of this psalm, there is an invitation to intimacy with Yahweh, right? Hebrew language, what we would say God. Intimacy with Yahweh. But there is this stark warning. And the warning is this, what runs in tension with intimacy with God is idolatry. The language that the psalmist used was idols. Christian language for idolatry basically means this, anything you give prioritized reverence, love, affection, worship, devotion, anything that is a greater priority over God. It's fascinating though. Because it's written by an anonymous author, it's written at almost like an anonymous time, and so you sit there and you wonder why, and the premise, I would say, is this, is because it applies to any people at any time. It could have been written to the Israelites, if you're familiar with the Old Testament narrative, as they have left Egypt behind them, and there is idolatry in their rearview mirror, but their hearts are dragging it with them. It could have been given to a time where Israel had conquered the land was supposed to fully obey. But if you know the story, they do what we have a tendency to do. They obey, sorta. And incomplete obedience is a disobedience. And God warned against it because he knows if you leave the tiniest bit of brokenness, it has an ability to creep in and break your heart. It could have been written during that time, it could have been written during a time, if you're familiar with the, the story of exile, a time where God came and brought discipline to his people, where he took them into exile to like almost refine and purge the brokenness from them so they could come back and live a life of wholeness, health, love, and worship. You pick the timeline, it could have been there. Here's the thing. This applies 21st century Western culture, 21st century 
America, 21st century, my life. You don't have to know the author. You don't have to know the time. Why? Because embedded in it is universal truth. It is a pleading heart to the follower of Yahweh, to the follower of Christ. And it says this, God has come to bring good things to you. We'll summarize it with a word, intimacy. But there's a predator. You have difficulty and dysfunction and you live in a society that does not want what the things of God are after. Christians have used the language that what do we strive against in our life? We strive against three general themes. The world, the flesh, the devil. Now that language might seem really strange to you, but I've heard it described this way, and I really appreciate it. The world, a culture that says, you do you, being normalized. It doesn't mean that they're terrible people, and if you're here and you don't believe in Jesus, I'm not saying you are an awful person. But I'm saying at the core of my faith is, the core, is a difference in the core of yours. The world celebrates that. The flesh, it's this Christian idea for, I do what I want, not what God wants. And it might seem like God is then a taskmaster or like a rule follower, and he's just waiting to like rip you off so you just live this bummed out life. Psalm 115 clearly outlines, he has not come to take from you. He came to give. And there's this language of the devil. Now I know for many of you, the idea of the devil is perhaps silly or mythology or whatever it would go. You should know this, according to the New Testament, Jesus was very clear about the devil. So if you want to take his views on love your neighbor, peace, harmony, perhaps even nonviolence, if you wanna take those, you have to take his stance on, there is an enemy. His native tongue is lies. Here's the reason I set that up. You and I today, if you want on this journey of faith as we are coming to the end of summer, like fall is before you. For many of us, that, op- that presents this opportunity to like reevaluate rhythms of life as you get back a routine and a schedule. Here's the thing that you and I got to discern. How much of my life goes the way of idolatry? Because it steals the intimacy. So that's what Psalm 115 is. It's an invitation to something different. And I want to present it this way. God throughout the Old Testament talks about a love of his people, almost like a marital love, like a commitment love, a covenantal love. We live in a time, like all times, where people, systems, things, our own brokenness, baggage, wounding, trauma, flesh, whatever word you want to put to it, try to distract us from that love, if not take us off that love. You experienced it this weekend when there was the moment where you raised your voice in sinful anger at a kid. You just felt the Holy Spirit just touch you. You experienced it this weekend when there was the moment of, say, perhaps food, alcohol, whatever, and your heart gave way to gluttony and coping because there was an emotional problem going on. And you, perhaps like I can do, you chose a cheeseburger over a moment of prayer. Or perhaps it's the moment of the secret sins that the family doesn't know, the roommates don't know, the things that you hide. At the crux of each one of those, regardless of your view on them, is this choice. Do I want intimacy or do I think life comes through idolatry? In order to fight that drift towards idolatry, what we need is this, rebellious loyalty. See, in our culture, it makes sense to you do you. In our culture, it makes sense to, if it feels good, it is good. What do we need if we want to persevere, to endure, and honestly, to enjoy the journey of faith? I would like to show how Psalm 115 is an invitation to you and to me to a life of rebellious loyalty. When I use the word rebellious, I don't mean contrarian, jerk, foolish, 
any of that. I mean, no, no, no. Everything is telling you go that way. And by faith in God, even when doubt creeps in, you say, Holy Spirit, help me. Members of the spiritual family, help me. I'll go this way. Jesus uses the language of the narrow road versus the wide. Y'all tracking with me? We're going to see an invitation today through Psalm 115 into a life of rebellious loyalty. We're going to look at it in two ways. This psalm at its highest level breaks out in two ways. The psalmist is going to outline what I will term lifeless idols. You could say idols without power. You could say inefficient, vacant. Most scholars use the word impotent. Lifeless idols. And the second thing we'll see it contrasted to, the living God. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm 115. If you don't have one, there's one in a chair in front of you. I'm a huge fan of like tactile reading along because it adds a whole nother sense to your engagement in this. That shared, if you want to like pretend you're looking on your phone and just check sports, news, Instagram, you can do that or it'll be back behind me. So glad you're here. We are going to look at a life of rebellious loyalty. The first section we're going to see is verses 1 through 8. We'll go from there. The first theme I want to highlight, though, is verses 1 through 2. Reading it again with me. Not to us, O Lord. Fascinating. Not to us, but to your name. Give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nation say, where is their God? A few, a few things taking place here. At its core, when it says the word nations, this has this idea of there's Jews and there's Gentiles. Gentiles were non-Jews. And Gentiles are mocking the God of the Jews. And they're saying, where is he? If he's so powerful, show it. Prove it. Do something. And the Israelites are crying out. Show them you're powerful. Show them you're better. Judge them. End them. Summary. Vindicate yourself, O oh God. And how do they want them to do it? Their language is glorify yourself. It's interesting, though. You have to understand the character and the nature of God as well as humanity. Like your Bible is an absolute master class in anthropology, the study of humanity, as well as sociology, the study of society, anthropology. The first thing that your Bible knows is the greatest thing that Israel often has going against them is not God show them your glory, but it's the line that they repeat, not to us, not to us. It's got two themes. They are trying to say, show the Gentiles who don't believe. And they're trying to say, I know I have a tendency to steal glory. Like the, the language that we would put to this is insecurity. They had a tendency towards insecurity and then overcompensating for that by seeking external validation, praise, performance, status, or stuff. How do I glorify me? They had a tendency to make life about them. And here's the fascinating thing. They were in a culture where they are saying, life is about God. And the Gentiles are saying, well, where's he at? Perhaps, just perhaps, it's because those Jews looked far too similar to those non-believing people. See, one of the things that's true about you and me is oftentimes followers of Jesus, we, the church, the people of God, have a tendency to look and act just like people who don't know God, believe in God, or say they have a heart to follow him. That's why I come from the beginning and say, not to us. They are fighting that internal bent towards, I want it to be about me. All of us, and I think some of us, are really good at this. A common term for this is narcissism. Narcissism. Now, narcissism has really become a, a hot topic recently. I'd put before you, narcissism is kind of like hunger, right? Here's what I mean by that. It's like hunger. Someone could come to you and be like, hey, are you hungry? And that is a yes or no question. Does that make sense? A yes or a no question. 
There's a difference, especially in a technical sense, of narcissist and non-narcissist. But here's the other thing. And some of y'all are thinking about, hey, husband, you listen to this? I'm talking about narcissism. You hear that? You hear that? And then some of you are like, that's my boss, right? But the second part about narcissism with hunger, there's also like a spectrum to this thing. If pride in the New Testament is the root of all evil, Christians should not have a problem saying they wrestle with a tendency towards narcissism. Now, there's a difference in a yes and a no. That's not who I am. I am a saint. I am a son. I am a servant. It's not who I am. But man, just like hunger, can I be growing in hunger and decreasing in hunger? Yes. Israel is aware of it in this moment. And then they come and encounter to that. They say, why should we glorify God? The answer they could give, and this matters for why you would give a rebellious loyalty to him. Why should we glorify God? Some of you, you think, because he's God, because he said so, because my parents told me to. You just do it. That's not going to cut it. The Holy Spirit, through the psalmist, gives this answer for why we glorify God. For the sake of your steadfast love. If you're with us last week, we talked about his said, his unbreaking, never-ending commitment to you. It's the type of love that we try to echo in the best of relationships, yet they all still fall short. So why do we glorify him and not us? Because he is the pinnacle of real love. And then because he's faithful, it's amazing. The reasons we glorify him is because he's good, not because of our good. The psalmist goes on in verses 3 through 7 to then say this is we're talking about. Now he'll really switch And he'll say, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. That's that's a contrasting theme. Remember, he just defined who is God and what does he do. Now stay with me. Their idols. Our God, their idols. He's created a pro-con list. Lifeless idolatry. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. Contrast, where's God? He's in the heavens. Where's their idols? Somebody made them in a furnace and then popped them out, put them together with wood or built them, modern day language, in an advertising PR firm. You track with me? If not, you're spending way too much money at Amazon. And this talk will save you so much money. Okay? Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They're not from heaven, they are human. And then hear this. This is the Holy Spirit using satire to mock the things that kill people. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. Hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they don't make a sound in their throat. God is prophetically speaking through his word in the psalmist. And he's countering it with, you follow something in the image of a fallen someone that cannot help you, that cannot hear you, that cannot talk with you. The big, the big contrast you have is always countered and it's fulfilled in Christ. Christ in his personhood, he has eyes, has mouth, he has, he, he has ears, he speaks, he listens, he engages relationally, he is life and he gives life. You're seeing this contrast of that and like a lifeless idol where it's this theme, they are not powerful and eventually they are not helpful. And then you get verse eight, the sinister impact of why God cares so much about idolatry. Those who make them become like them. Uh, So do all who trust in them. It's this spiritual promise, right? Uh, Christian uh, theologians call it the law of returns. The law of returns. Uh, You could also say this language. It's probably language you've heard. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. This is very different than like some Christian practice of karma though. Here's what this means. If you sow, if you plant 
a heart of idolatry, you will reap a life of idolatry, insecurity. You reap what you sow. We are constantly being formed into the image of someone. It's the reason many of us, you follow influencers or idols or whatever it would be. We are wanting to become like that person. That is actually, or excuse me, absolutely true of the Christian journey. Christ offers a different way where he says this, no, 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 follow me. Follow me. Why does Jesus say, follow me? If you follow me, you will be with me. If you are with me, you will become like me. What is the counter to spiritual deformation? Discipleship. Uh, you would use the language with your kids. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. My heart I have like a broken appetite. If I feed that appetite, it grows. If you feed your heart an appetite of idolatry, do not be shocked when you no longer crave the things of God. Christ is after a redeemed craving. That's why this Christian journey it is a saved by faith, this justification, it is so real. But the process of justification fueled sanctification is I am with Christ, being with him, becoming like him, imaging him, not my broken tendencies. So here's the thing. If we want rebe rebellious loyalty, just like Israel, it demands, it demands a thoughtful strategy. Most folks go through life just feeling, well, don't give in to idolatry. Well, I should get rid of a shrine in my house. Uh, I should ditch that. And then most Western folks know, all right, there's probably some form of excess materialism, but even that is diminishing in the church, right? Uh, materialism is one of the great stains on the Western church because it's been normalized. And through an insidious lie of something called a prosperity gospel, where people say, if you do good, God will give you good. It can almost be expected in a cruel way. Where the people of God have always been known for something different. That shared, I want to put before you, rebellious loyalty is the invitation. It's different. It's counter-cultural. And it's beautiful. Rebellious loyalty, if you want a thoughtful strategy for it, is, in my opinion, you got to understand, and there's so much more than this, three of the primary idols of the 21st century. Three of the primary idols. They're this. Stuff, status, sexuality, or sex. Right? And, and, and this, I think, is the last week with a bunch of college students before they go off to college. The affection for your heart will be around three things. Stuff, status, sex. Stuff. Here is the lie that culture normalizes. The lie of stuff is excess equals abundance. Stuff equals happiness. Never mind, we've all read like some form of enough of like psychology today where you've heard the term hedonic adaptation. Y'all heard that term? Okay. Wake up! <laughs> Wake up! This is a, maybe it's because my kids woke me up and I'm too tired. If you are looking for a place to be moderately bored on Sunday mornings, we need the seat and preschool needs space for the kid. <laughs> okay? So we love you. I don't know how else to say the rest of the sentence without being rude. <laughs> but, eh, eh. Hedonic adaptation. What makes you happy now is always short term. It's never lasting. Cultivating gratitude leads to contentment. That changes your level of happiness. New stuff, new status, new sex, we'll see. It doesn't make permanent change. Why? You are trying to fill something that cannot be filled. But you see this with stuff. We call it materialism wealth. Here, here's the thing. The best idols hide behind real needs, real spiritual needs. The idol of stuff hide behind an idol of comfort, or you could say security. It's fascinating, though, because you've got to wonder, does it work? Dr. Ed Diner, 
He's a psychology professor and a happiness expert. I don't know how you get that title. I don't know, but he's a doctor, right? In a New York Times article titled this, Materialism is Bad for You, Studies Say, wrote this. Those who value material success more than they value happiness. Christian word there is well-being or contentment, right? This guy, not Christian, not writing from Christian perspective. We'll, we'll just see. Does the lie of stuff and abundance equals excess or excess equals abundance, does it work? Success, more than those who value happiness, are likely to experience almost as many negative moods as positive moods. They're very moody. Whereas those who value happiness over material success are likely to experience considerably more pleasant moods and emotions than unpleasant moods and emotions. Being greedy makes you needy. Being greedy makes you needy. So here's the thing. Excess being abundance, it literally breaks you down. Now, I'm not saying you got to go on like a revolt of minimalism. I'm saying this. The Christian perspective is, I won't find life here. And I'm after life. The second one that we really see, I would say status. You perhaps might like the term though, success. The lie that's normalized in our culture would go this way. You are what you do. You are what you do. If before with stuff, we saw that it is a lie against the truth of comfort, security. This is a lie against identity. Who you are. I think this shows up predominantly for men in you are what you do. If your job title is not this, if you are not that, I think it's the reason why so many folks, especially men, have a midlife crisis. Because they get halfway through, and I know like, like millennials, we developed a quarter life crisis because we're needy like that. And then the true statement is if you're here and you're Gen Z, you're just constantly in crisis, right? <laughs> so you do you, right? But before it was like this thing called midlife crisis. It's very retro. It's fascinating. But because they get to a point in life and they're like, wait, 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 my status isn't what I wanted it to be. They measure it by promotions, job, wealth, retirement, stuff, quality of relationship, whatever it would be. They're not where they wanted to be. I think the same thing can be true of women, regardless of being a mom, not being a mom. A woman is expected in our cultural moment to be defined by status or success as you have to be a rock star mom, you have to work full time, and you have to be totally physically fit. That's not possible. That gets your applause? Okay, at least you're awake, right? I know the like AC is off this morning, but you're with me, okay? We could do this. All right, but, but here's the thing. We got to ask, okay, what's behind this drive for success? Fascinating thing. Have you ever looked? You haven't, but I have because I'm a dork like this. The rate of highly successful people, right? Top folks, top performers, CEOs, whatever word you want to put to it, in a rate of childhood trauma. There's a disproportionate connection to a sense of neglect, abuse, abandonment, whatever it might be, producing a not enoughness in fueling an ambition. So here's my question. We have to come and look at the why. This is Matthew Gallagher. He's a journalist. He wrote an article from Pain to Power, how to understand the link between childhood trauma and entrepreneurship. But for entrepreneurship, they just can't get the best objective data for this. So you could put top performer, any field you want. Here's what he wrote. A study found that individuals who experienced adverse events in childhood were more likely to become entrepreneurs. Again, top performers, however you want to describe. Trouble in childhood has been correlated with success later in life. Dude, some of the most driven, performing, obsessive people are some of the most wounded. And if that's you, if it's me, we are all welcome here. He concludes, though, of course, that same drive has also been linked to mental disorders, drug addiction, and homelessness. It is a double-edged sword. So maybe, just maybe, that finding identity through status or the lie that you are what you do is a modern-day idol that is crippling people. It's why the rate of Adderall, like physicians going to prescribe Adderall, can't prescribe it. Why? It's so abused at upper high school and college campuses because there's a drive to perform, perform, 
perform, perform. If you're going to college and the best you can do is righteously get a B without some drug, get a B. God will provide for you. That's radical. That is rebellious loyalty. Third thing, sex. Sexuality, right? We, we would probably prefer a term here about intimacy and what it's meant by God, but here's what the lie about sex is. And this is really downstream, right, of Darwin's theory of evolution, where everyone just became an animal. And if you're just an animal, then there's nothing sacred in you. There is no soul. The lie about sex is this. Sex is purely physical, not spiritual. Now, the fascinating thing is to see the overwhelming amount of secular data coming out contrary to that. Where I absolutely believe, especially in the next 20 years, abstinence is going to make a revival. And I don't think it'll be led by the church. Now, I say that as sexual sin having plagued much of my life, there's no shame here. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying this lie, it's just physical, not spiritual. Many of us know from our own life experience that's just not true. But secular research shows that's just not true. And when you live this way, because what are we trying to understand? Lifeless idols. If you want rebellious loyalty, you've got to have a strategy, which means you've got to be aware. Stuff, it won't give life. It like subtly kills. Status, it won't bring life. It will leave you not enough chasing the next thing. And sex coming, if the others are a lie against security, identity, this is a lie against intimacy. Are you really loved? Is it worth waiting? Most Christians have answered that question with, yes, why? They had a shame-induced pursuit of purity. That ain't what I'm teaching. I'm saying you have been made in the image of the creator. Following his way will lead to life. It's amazing the neurochemicals, oxytocin, vasopressin, who create in a moment of intimacy an attachment. Studies show how repeated sense of attachment to multiple people makes it harder to attach later. I use that as secular research proving it's not just physical. The Christian view is it's sacred. Now, the other thing that Christians uphold, this is why we don't worship lifeless idols but a living God. God can redeem anyone and anything. So if you're here and you feel the twinge of shame, you are so welcome here. Our God is good, and he loves you. Here's what we're seeing. We are invited to a life of, of rebellious loyalty. But in order to do it, you have to fight a temptation to idolatry. Mature Christians know this. Immature Christians, if you ask them, hey man, if Satan were to take you out, how would he do it? They're like, what? That would never happen. Mature ones are like, how much time do you have? <laughs> you free right now? Can you like push your next meeting? Like you want like just blanket statement or you want like a broke, I got like a list. You think I'm kidding. I'm, I could send you my list. You gotta think that way. But that takes us to what is the answer? If that's the void, what is the answer? Let's continue in the psalmist's writing in verses 9 through 11. We're, we're seeing a life of rebellious loyalty. We've seen the first thing you got to recognize, there's lifeless idols. Many of us, we bow at the lifeless idols, not bow at the king. But now we are invited in contrast to that. There's lifeless idols, and then you'll see the language, the living God. You can know them and become like them, and it will lead to your demise or you can know him and become like him and it will lead to your beauty. Oh Israel, this is a call to all of Israel, it's gonna be fascinating. Command, trust in the Lord. My translation, be rebelliously loyal. Trust in the Lord, why? He is their help and their shield. Oh house of Aaron, that's the priestly class, which means this message ain't just for people, it's for priests, for pastors, for everybody. We're all human. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. Why? Again, he is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, which scholars would say, this is obviously all people, but also it's giving inclusion to Jew and Gentile. The term would have been proselyte. 
a Gentile that had converted to the way of God, the faith of Yahweh. Does that make sense? So it is already this multi-ethnic inclusion of a new family. More on that another time. You who fear the Lord, same command, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So we are looking at, okay, the living God contrasted to lifeless idols, and we're seeing his power. The first thing that we see here, we are called to be loyal to God. Why? He is our provider. He is our protector. The language of the psalmist, he is our help and our shield. It's fascinating as the invitation is for all people, but then you see this rhythm of who God is. Most of you think that when God tells you to do something, the reason he says it is because I said so. Because I'm God. Do it. So you know, he could do that. He has the right to do that. But if you see a repeating refrain throughout the truth and the character and nature of God, he says what? Trust in the Lord. And then repeatedly throughout the psalm, he says, why? He'll be your provider. He'll be your protector. He's going after the idolatry and the idol of finding security and comfort apart from him. You see that? He's saying, no, no, no. I'm not going to go at like a symptom level. I'm going to do it like a soul root level. I, I heal here. Don't live here. Abide with me here. That's the first theme. Verses 12 through, I think, 15. Yeah, let's read that. He continues on breaking down who is the living God. It's the first theme is he is provider and protector. He loves you. You can trust him. It goes on in 12 through 13. The Lord has remembered us. That's one of the lines, so you know, some folks put it at is post-exile. But that's for my Bible nerds out there. We all love being a Bible nerd here. It says this, who is God? He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. And then just to make sure everyone knows, well, who's he talking about? Both the small and the great. From the CEO to the one on welfare, to the halls of Harvard Graduate School, to those who never made it past fourth grade. He says, I will give good to you. He even summarized that the Holy Spirit and the psalmist stops and has a prayer of blessing over the people. May the Lord give you increase. You, and he doesn't just stop there because he knows the heart of every good parent is not just their blessing, but their kid's blessing. May the Lord give you increase. You and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, not who is made by human hands, but who is on heaven and on earth. We're seeing the reality of the living God. We saw he's provider, he's protector. He'll take care of you. He meets the reality of security and of comfort. The second we see, we're loyal. God is a giver. He changes your identity. Why does he give to you? Because he's paternal. He's a father. He wants your blessing. But many of us think about the ways of God. It's this. Well, he came to take. Man, I go to school. If I got to study for a test, Adderall, I got to perform. God says don't, but then I won't get the right job. If I don't get the right job, then I won't be happy. Then my parents won't be happy. Stop living for that. He came to take. No, man, this feeling, this urge, when I'm with him, when I'm with her, this is where life is, this is happiness. And, and you know what? Maybe we'll get married, maybe we won't get married, but who really cares? That's so traditional and antiquated. Or money. No, 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 man. I grew up broke. My parents didn't have anything. I could give my life to this, and I'm going to be different. I'm going to provide. We're going to take care. We're never going to be stressed. And then you're absent. He's pleading. What scares you, I will protect you from. You can trust me. You see, the reality that he's building to is he's inviting you and me into loyalty as he says, I'm far more loyal to you than you will ever be to me. Followers of Jesus, we know this is proved through the cross, where despite our dysfunction, our baggage, our sin, the God-man Christ, he died on behalf of all of it. He is far more loyal and loving to me than I will ever be to him. And even though my whole journey of faith, to use the language of a member of the body, is stumbling my way towards eternity, he loves to help me. 
I'm not a disappointment. I mess it up. I am forgiven. I'm clean. I am whole. I do not have it all together. But he has me. So I will be okay. Which evokes a final theme about the living God versus the lifeless idol. Remember the lifeless idol? Steals the glory. Can't even speak. But then it comes to the people. The he- 16 through 18, we'll close here. The heavens, are the, lo- the heavens are the Lord's heavens, which is just awesome. But the earth he has given to the children of man. Then he describes two paths of people on the earth. The first, the dead, that's a spiritual dead as well as a physical. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. Glory is connected with a form of worship and praise. God is directly contrasting, if you live a life of generally self-praise, you will end up in a place where there is no praise, where there's no worship, where there's no joy. Which evokes, what should we as his people do and be? But we will bless the Lord. In the midst of a culture that goes one way, we won't be cruel, we won't be condemning, we won't be judgmental jerks. We will graciously and lovingly and gently but absolutely firmly present another way. It is narrow, it's hard. And it is better. Why would we do it? He will provide. Sometimes I have no idea how. He will protect. Sometimes I have no idea why. And he will love. It's who he is. Closes. From this time forth. And we are literally the fulfillment of this verse. And forevermore, praise the Lord. I'll close with this. The Christian journey, is, it's a posture of bowing. It is coming before God in imperfection, saying, I really like making a king of my life. I bow to you. There's beauty in the posture of bowing. The most described posture of prayer throughout the Bible is actually laying face down, prostrate. As I thought on that, there's something about what idols have a do is a tendency to pull me off track, to get up and run the other direction. We are people who learn to joyfully bow. Why? He's worthy. The other reason, it makes it harder to get up. I'm just telling you. The Holy Spirit knows our temptation towards idolatry, which is our invitation to a rebellious loyalty. Let me pray as we close with the act of celebrating and praise through communion. Uh, First thing is you're just sitting here, if you're a follower of Jesus, I invite you just by yourself to say, hey, Holy Spirit, would you show me Where are the places I drift to lifeless idols? Take 10 seconds in silence. And if you're brave enough, allow him to show you. With with that in mind, For those who are followers of Jesus, you don't have to out loud, but we come and where we confess. We are prone to wander. We think we are above the whole idolatry thing. We think sin doesn't really matter. I tolerate what you died for. And then we thank. Thank you for the grace of the cross, the mercy, the forgiveness, the hope. I'm not marked by the stain, the sorrow, or the sin. I'm marked by you. I'm healed as I'm healing. I am loved as I'm growing in love and I am holy as I am becoming holy. Glory to you. May we be a people of praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen.